Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you to my sponsors at NIH and the Recovery Research Institute as well. Um, I'm going to cover the recovery science today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the recovery science of health equity, um, what we know about it, and how we can make science more useful going forward. I feel like at first you have to know how we got here, though. Uh, picking at one starting point, it was probably nearly about 20 years ago, there was a landmark report from the Institute of Medicine that found striking disparities in the burden of illness experienced by Black Americans. This was a turning point that put health equity on the national stage and really crystallized the need for rigorous scientific approaches to minority health and health disparities. Now, our field of substance use disorders is no exception. We have 40 years of evidence showing that Black Americans suffer a disproportionate burden of health and social consequences, despite having sometimes lower or equivalent prevalence of substance use and substance use disorders. So if you have to capture the health disparity in one sentence that you walk away with from today, it would be that. But why do health disparities exist? Well, health inequities exist due to disproportionate exposure to risk and protective factors. For example, despite um, African-Americans making up only about 14% of the US population, black individuals consist of 40% of individuals who are unhoused in this country. Uh, another example is today for every $1 in white child households, black families have one cent. So uh, we also know that even basic needs like car purchases cost an average of $2,600 more for black individuals, even when they have superior credit than their white counterparts. And these are th things that we've learned from strong scientific designs, some of our most important leaders have cited the social and moral unacceptability of having health disparities by race. Now, we have many unanswered questions regarding racial health equity when it comes to recovery science, and advancing improvements in this area will require several steps. Um, the first is a little bit of racial literacy um, and having a basic understanding of what race is, particularly when we use it in the context of science or when we use it in the context of medicine. Race was derived as a social construct um, and it should not be interpreted as a proxy for ancestry, biology, genetics, or class. We used to do that a lot with class, but this is a distinct construct that should be interpreted as a caste system, the effects of a caste system. And what's happened, generally speaking, when we see how race has been applied and interpreted in science and medicine is there's been a number of missteps along the way where we were uh, did not report accurately what we measured. We've called ancestry race and vice versa. We've made a mess out of that. Um, we have misinterpret data. Um, coming from a racialized background, we've interpreted data that African Americans need less anesthesia rather than providers consistently provide less anesthesia, um, a, rep a repeated finding. And so there's a number of examples in health and medicine where our interpretation and applications of race um, are, are misapplied and misunderstood. Uh, but we're trying to learn from those things, particularly as we move forward regarding the recovery agenda. The next step though, in under advancing health equity and recovery science is to really identify recovery indicators that establish a baseline and determine the degree to which a health disparity exists. Now, we did this with substance use disorders. It revealed racial differences in course of illness and remission. For example, we know individuals who identify as Black progress from the initiation of first use to the onset of the disorder faster. This is an effect in the literature known as telescoping. And this can be applied to groups and averages of people. It's not interpreted on an individual level. Um, additionally, we know that individuals who identify as Black have a later age of onset of a substance use disorder, which comes in their mid-20s, compared to others who onset in their late teens. 
But despite this delayed onset, we know that in Black individuals with a high school education are more than twice as likely as their equally educated white counterparts to have a persistent or ongoing substance use disorder. In fact, we've seen replicated in national data several times that Black individuals are less than half as likely to remit from, from drug use disorders than their white counterparts. They experience a more chronic course of illness despite equivalent prevalence and a later age of onset. And what do we know about when it comes to uh, lethal overdose? Uh, Peter touched upon this just a little bit, actually. The rate of overdose mortality did overtake, um, in, uh, among Black individuals, did overtake that of white individuals in the year 2020 for the first time since 1999. In fact, that's so profound. I think I want to show you exactly what that looks like. In this case, you can see this is where we get that from. At this point, it's the American in Indians and the Alaska Natives, as he said, who have the highest rate. And here's the line that shows you when COVID hit, right? And so things got worse during COVID. And that's what we know about that. Um, additionally, it's important to understand that when you look here, it's important to understand that uh, this effect is largely driven by black males over the age of 55, as indicated by that skyrocketing blue line. So, you know, what do we know about these individuals, black individuals over the age of 55? Well, these may have been individuals who most likely made it through one of the previous opioid waves. Uh, perhaps they were being maintained on methadone or due to release from mass incarceration, they come out and they're exposed to a changing drug supply that's driven right now by illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And therefore they're highly vulnerable to fatal overdose. Either way, we know that COVID made things worse and it exposed how longstanding structural inequities remain a root cause of poor health outcomes. My point is that recovery indicators and course of recovery, not just course of illness and overdose need to be identified and compared for racial health equity, the way we did for substance use disorders. For example, um, long versus short-term recovery. Are black individuals equally as likely to achieve stable recovery? five or more years. This is incredibly important because we already know it takes about five years of continuous sobriety before the risk of relapse in the following year drops below 15%, which is when you're no more likely than someone in the general population to have a substance use disorder. So these are some of the questions that we need to answer in recovery science, particularly regarding long-term recovery. Additionally, um, recovery capital, is now an emerging international construct for the addiction field. It represents the sum total assets needed to initiate and sustain recovery, and it mitigates the biopsychosocial stressors that are associated with adaptation to abstinence. Now, our preliminary evidence has shown that Black individuals score higher on recovery capital compared to their white counterparts. But we need to investigate if there are specific dimensions that can be harnessed to create, to create equity in the likelihood of remission or equity and the number of recovery attempts it takes to resolve a problem with alcohol or other drugs, which currently stands at on national average two recovery attempts, unless you're identified as black and then you have three recovery attempts on average. You know, in the past, again, regarding the recovery science agenda, we've looked at racial equivalence in treatment access, retention, and barriers to care. From this, we learned of considerable racial disparities in the treatment of opioid use disorder. Specifically, we have a two-tiered treatment system where buprenorphine, which is a life-saving medication you can take from the comfort of your own home, is at, tends to be more accessed by individuals who identify as white and individuals with higher incomes, while methadone on average is a 40-minute daily drive to the local clinic. It is accessed by people of color 
and people with low incomes. We also know from a study called the Cascade of Care that revealed, revealed that treatment disparities for opioid use disorder in part may be driven by the diagnosis being a secondary diagnosis for black individuals rather than a primary, which is what we're more likely to see in white individuals. So trying to identify why and where um, access to care does not seem to be equivalent. And now we also know that these racial inequities in access to treatment for opioid use disorder has been replicated both in youth and in the perinatal populations with opioid use disorder as well. So uh, it's not seeing any boundaries. Uh, importantly noted, we've also known that white individuals are entering treatment for heroin use disorder around the age of 25 to 29, while black individuals are entering treatment at the age of 45 to 49. This translates into a 20 year delay. And as you know, this matters because early access to care is associated with a better prognosis. So how does this translate to recovery science? Well, we need to be asking the same questions. Is there racial equity in access to, retention in, and barriers to recovery support services like peer-based recovery coaching, recovery community centers, and recovery residencies? We may indeed find that the utilization of, P of recovery support services actually helps to improve equity and that using peers as opposed to professionals alone is a way to penetrate communities and go into areas that have developed high levels of medical mistrust. One of the final steps that we can take to advance health equity when we use recovery science is we need to identify mechanisms of disparities. These are also what we call our known hypothesized causes, and they may operate in a complex web of pathways. And ultimately, mechanisms should be actionable targets and the focus of intervention science to address drivers of health inequities in recovery. Now, in the past, I can tell you that mechanisms research and in substance use disorders has largely focused on behavior change at the individual level, at the interpersonal level exchanges, despite increasing national recognition of the structural drivers of health disparities. This has resulted in limited impact on sustained improvements in disparities over time. You know, our own research at the Recovery Research Institute, we learned that nearly 19% of people in the US who were resolved a problem with alcohol or other drugs uh, reported being treated unfairly by the police because they knew about their history with alcohol or other drugs. We also learned that 15% of the people in this country who resolved a problem with alcohol or other drugs still report receiving inadequate medical treatment because they know about their history. 11% of the people who are in recovery in this country say that their insurance does not cover some of their medical costs. 16% say they could not get a job. 12% report being denied a loan because somebody knew about their history. 9% denied housing. 8% have been denied nutritional assistance in their recovery. And another 8% are being reported that they have, they've been denied the right to vote because somebody knew about their alcohol or drug history. But these experiences, the people who experience this, it was associated with increased psychological distress, lower quality of life, and lower recovery capital. And some of these recovery-related discriminations are a direct result of our federal policies and insurance policies that govern the rights of those convicted by drug offenses. And if you're black, the odds of experiencing recovery related discrimination are even worse. Black people who have resolved a problem with alcohol or other drugs in this country were more than twice as likely to report that they lost their job because somebody knew about their history, more than three times as likely than their white counterparts to report not being able to get a job and four times as likely to say they had a job but couldn't get a promotion and they were three times as likely to report being denied housing because somebody knew about their history. These types of structural components in housing, in job creation, need to be investigated as mechanisms of health inequities and for their disproportionate impact 
on racial and ethnic minorities and their impact on everybody in general. We need to reissue building permits in terms of access to higher education, nutritional assistance, housing, voting, employment. These are the levers that we can pull to reshape the landscape of recovery. We need to change the narrative to focus how our institutions magnify harm from disorder rather than minimize harm and promote recovery. In fact, recovery, unlike disorder, is a strength-based paradigm, and it can be used to highlight resilience, empowerment, and accomplishments that people have achieved in recovery along the way. In our nationally representative study of people who overcame an alcohol or drug problem, we examined four domains of achievements, including uh, personal self-improvement, like returning to school. We looked at civic participation, like volunteering, giving to charity, helping others, family achievements, like regaining custody of a child or financially supporting loved ones, and economic participation, like acquiring a car or purchasing a home. And we found that individuals who identified as Black had higher total achievements than any other racial group, which was specifically driven by higher family engagement in recovery. So this is great news because termination of parental rights and risk of foster, foster care placement is marked by glaring racial and class disparities that pervasively disrupt Black communities. While African-American children are about 14% of the nation's children, they account for 23% of the foster care population, despite equivalent child maltreatment rates as white children at the same level of poverty. Therefore, engagement or re-engagement with the family is likely occurring more frequently among those who identify as Black because these individuals experience more family disruption and financial disadvantage before and in the context of an addiction. So accomplishments, this is just one example of how recovery science can be more useful moving forward and knowing what factors uh, influence the accrual of achievements and how achievements relate to functioning would support treatment and policy planning and instill and inspire hope for individuals. In fact, by the year 2060, there'll be no single racial or ethnic majority in this country. So it's critical for all of us to anticipate increasing diversity in all the work that we do. We want health for all. And this is how recovery science can be used to identify health inequities, actionable targets as mechanisms of disparities that should ultimately lead to the focus of intervention. I'll stop there. Thank you.